everyone. I'm just going to uh, wait for the participants uh, to enter the room and get on to the uh, audio connection, and then we will begin uh, today's webinar very shortly. Okay, it looks like we uh, we are starting to even out on the participants. So I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, I'm from Queen's University Industrial Relations Center and we are delivering today's webinar in conjunction with Talent Canada. So my name is Alison Darling. I am the moderator of today's session and I'm the director of professional programs here at Queen's University IRC. So it is a delight uh, if it's morning or afternoon for you. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. So to begin, I would like to acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee First Peoples. Uh, we are very grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. I know that you'll be joining us from across the country. We call Canada, but it is important that we recognize the lands from which we are joining you today as we all try to move forward in reconciliation. So a couple of housekeeping items to start with. This session will be recorded and the recording will be sent out to you, uh, I think about 24 hours after the session. So if for some reason you need to, to step off the call or if you have technical issues, don't worry, you will be receiving a recording from us uh, with the content today. You can also ask a question using the chat function or the Q&A function at the top. We will save all of those questions for the dedicated Q&A session at the end, but please send those through. Um, during the session, as questions come up, we, we really look forward to answering those for you at the end. So just a little bit of information about Queen's University IRC before we get into the uh, webinar today. So we are a professional development training, or we offer uh, professional development training in labor relations, human resources, and organizational development. So we are part of Queen's University and fall within the Faculty of Arts and Science here. Uh, we've been offering our training for over 85 years. So last October, we celebrated our 85th anniversary. We were founded in 1937. Um, and our programs are designed for busy practitioners who are looking to develop specific skills that are relevant to their jobs. Participants can take uh, programs that are two to five days in length. We offer open enrollment programs. One thing that's quite unique about us is we, we offer those programs across Canada from Victoria to Halifax and many stops in between. In addition to our open enrollment programs, we also offer customized trainings where we work one on one with organizations to meet their specific training needs. People can take our programs independently or can stack them up in two certificates and many participants choose to do that. We currently offer four certificates, uh, labor relations, advanced labor relations, advanced human resources and organizational development fundamentals. Uh, and we've been told that we're quite good at what we do last year, last September, we won the HRD Reader's Choice Award for Best Service Provider at the 2022 Canadian HR Awards. So we will be going back in September to try and retain that title uh, and hope to see some of you there. So uh, let's get on to the, the session today. So our webinar is entitled Revitalize Your Workforce, Why Training and Development Holds the Key to Success in the pan Post-Pandemic World. So a really key and timely topic uh, as training and development is becoming more and more important um, and more and more of a differentiator for organizations. So I am delighted to be joined by some of my colleagues today. Uh, firstly, we have David Mignot, who is the Director of Human Resources here at Queen's within the Faculty of Arts and Science. So hello, David, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Hello. Allison, and thanks for having me and uh, really uh, welcome the discussion we'll have today. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, David. And we are joined by Wiley Burke, who is an IRC facilitator. Wiley facilitates both our talent management program and strategies for workplace conflict, so very much tied into today's uh, webinar topic. So hi, Wiley, and thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Thrilled to be here. Learning and development is near and dear to my heart, so I love to talk about it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Wiley. And we're also joined by Devin Corrigan, who is an IRC facilitator as well. He uh, leads the Mastering Fact Finding and Investigations program that we offer. So Devin, it is great to have you here with us this morning as well. Hi, Allison. Thank you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to being part of this discussion. 
Excellent, great, thank you. So I will stop sharing the screen uh, or the slides for a time so that you can, uh, you know, get to see people's responses a little bit more, but we will jump into our questions. Um, so the first question that we have, you know, we are hearing a lot of the importance of a, a culture of learning, but how do you create uh, and build a, a culture of learning? And how can HR and senior management work together to create that type of culture? So Devon, I'm going to come over to you first of all, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, and I think it's a great question to kick off this uh, session. And really, I look at it as being the $64,000 question. Of course, everybody wants to know how they build a culture of learning because of the positive impacts that having a culture like that presents to an organization. And like anything else, it really starts at the top. So senior management has to support and really be committed to making the change. So changing their current culture to reflect more of culture of learning, that's a significant ask um, that will require time, require, um, let's be honest, money. <laughs> and um, I think that's, that's critical to the success of, of moving towards a culture of learning. And I guess the second part of that question is really how, how does senior management then marry up with human resources to make that change happen? And I think kind of a real practical step to take here is to meet with employees individually. And, and when I say meet with employees, to meet with them to talk about their own training and development plan. Um, you know, how is it that they're going to continue to grow within the organization to meet the um, the, the achievements they want to, to make, and obviously understanding the, the gaps that, um, that, 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 that are there. So what do they have to fill? And I suggest meeting employees monthly. Uh, some might think that's a little too much, but I think quarterly at the latest, um, because these continuous discussions are very helpful in determining what the path is for employees to, to really move towards achieving these goals. And when you're having these meetings, it's really starting to change the focus to a culture of learning. And, and these meetings are, for example, you'd say, okay, last month we, we talked about you wanting to get a skill in dealing with difficult conversations. Did you take a course to do that? If so, did you feel that it was effective? Did you develop a skill set that you feel you're comfortable with? And when these discussions are happening, it really makes the employee think critically about their own path of learning. And when all employees are thinking that way, it really starts to shift the culture towards more of a culture of learning. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dave. Great, thanks, Devin. Yeah, I think Devin hit on some uh, really good points there. Um, I would just kind of echo that I think you need to start off by creating a really safe space for a generative dialogue with HR and leaders on really kind of the simple question is, what is a learning culture? And, and for us at Queen's, we look at a learning culture as an environment where employees share a communal uh, growth mindset. And we try to highlight and champion employees that are eager to apply new learnings with an equity and diversity lens to their operations and really share their knowledge and differing experiences that they come with, with their teammates and always seek to uh, get at new opportunities to improve their abilities. And just one other piece that I would hit on because uh, I'm in HR and have done lots of recruiting, I would say you really need to higher strategically and try to embed these values of continuous learning in the onboarding process as well. The first three months, the first six months of a new employee's journey to really show the importance of learning and development. Um, it's critical to really hire wisely to contribute to the organization's culture of learning. Um, and when recruiting new staff, try to remember that we're looking for individuals that have that really that passion for, for learning. Um, but yeah, with that, maybe I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Wiley as well to see if she has any other thoughts. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. And uh, thank you, Devin. So a couple things that I, I can add in here. I think certainly, Devin, you touched on this, um, really having learning starting at that C-suite level in an organization. So I think one of the things that is absolutely critical is that modeling of learning behavior at the, at the very top. 
Uh, so talking about learning more openly, what are the learning ob objectives of the C-suite over the course of a, a year? Um, and how does that roll down into, you know, at a team level, right? So how do we start talking about learning objectives on our teams and having each individual at a team level be responsible for one of those learning objectives? Um, I think social learning and really leveraging the platforms that we have in our organizations, uh, like Teams, Zoom, all of these things that we do have access to and creating this culture where you can knowledge share and, and leverage those sort of technologies in order to do that. Um, I think all of those are great strategies. Uh, one of the things that I think Shopify has done that's really interesting is they've canceled all their meetings and there's a real dialogue happening around you know, how do we move meetings from the sort of, you know, uh, not really getting much out of them into a really interesting sort of workshop brainstorming exercise. So what are the problems that we're trying to solve? And those little things can really help uh, encourage this culture of learning, which is uh, bringing groups of people together, you know, with varied perspectives to really expand, um, expand our learning, learning from each other. Um, but yes. Uh, I think um, I think that covers it for me. That's great, excellent. Some really great insights there. So, kind of some of the key takeaways that that I'm hearing here is yes, we need to start at the C level, you know, C suite level. So it starts at the top. It comes down, um, empowering individual employees to take responsibility, um, modeling for them, but then meeting with employees and making sure we follow up on that. Um, and in addition to starting at the top, you know, when we're looking at hiring, hiring in strategically. Uh, making sure that, you know, the onboarding is in line with, with training that, that needs to be developed. And again, getting the experience and, you know, the, the input of ev everyone in terms of the equity, diversity and inclusion lens, you know, it, it's, it's excellent. So yeah, that's a, a lot of great learning pieces that I've taken away there. So thank you very much for that. So going into the second question, then what are some of the biggest challenges and opportunities for organizations in terms of upskilling or even reskilling their workforce coming out of the pandemic? So Wiley, I'd like to go to you first of all to get your thoughts on that one. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Um, there's no shortage of both challenges and opportunities here. I think one of the things that most organizations um, will agree with is that learning has often sat in a corner of an organization uh, and focused primarily on mandatory training or leadership training. So um, what that means is that we're not sort of at that grassroots level inside the organization to really understand what are the skills that we need to be developing? How are we thinking about the skills that we need to develop today versus you know, the future proofing our organizations through uh, learning and development initiatives and understanding you know, what are some of those future skills we need to be focusing on? Uh, so asking the organization propelling questions like, you know, how is technology going to change the shape of our organization or industry in 2030? And, you know, really getting a sense for where the organization is going to go. Uh, what are those skills gaps um, that will unleash the talent inside our organization by understanding what we have inside our organization, but also give us a really good understanding of what are the skills that we, we may need to be looking for in the marketplace. Um, and I think part of that is shifting uh, learning from you know, job-based learning into skills-based learning uh, and getting a little bit more detailed in terms of um, what that actually looks like. Um, but I'm going to, I'll pass it over to, to Devin uh, to share his thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Wally. And, and it's something you said that was really resounding. I like, I like the, the term you use, future proofing. I can't agree more. And, you know, we look at, we're in the age of automation now, and, and it looks like um, before 2023, there'll be 375 million global jobs uh, that'll be amended or lost based on automation and AI. So what does that mean for employees? It means that they're going to have to reskill and upskill to, to, to survive, uh, to be quite honest. So that's a huge challenge for organizations and, and for employees alike. Um, and just a, just a couple of quick hits here, it, it, just to show how important this is, is that Amazon has committed $700 million to train and reskill 100,000 of their employees um, before 2025. Uh, PricewaterhouseCooper in the same boat has invested $3 billion in skill training um, to train 
300,000 of their employees. And AT&T invested $1 billion in online courses and created what they call a career center, which is specifically focused to upskill their employees. So it's a significant um, issue that has to be tackled. And it looks like some organizations are doing it and some are a little bit slow off, off the uh, first pitch. But I think the main takeaway here um, is that organizations have to start focusing on what new skills will be in the future to, to prepare their employees and ultimately to prepare themselves to adapt to uh, the changing uh, landscape. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dave. Thanks, Devin. And, and yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of us would love to have the, the budgets of, of Amazon or AT&T, but I think it really does show the importance in that training and development and upskilling and reskilling is a strategic enabler and training and development really is an investment. It's not just a sunk cost that, that sometimes it's looked at. Um, I think we've found that disruption and change has really been a constant in the last few years. And one thing I would just want to hit on is, you know, burnout, anxiety, stress has deeply impacted all of us, all, all employees. Um, and we've really had to focus on emotional intelligence and principles like empathy, esteem, understanding, adaptability, like, like Devin hit on as well, um, in our kind of new normal of remote and, and hybrid work and, and looking to upskill and reskill in that manner. So I would say the number one focus we've also tried to look at at Queen's has been employee health and well-being and need to shift our focus to really look at that employee well-being to ensure that people can thrive mentally, physically, emotionally um, at Queen's. And the other thing, we've, we've had lots of turnover and also budget constraints over the last few years. So we've needed to be a bit creative and had to look inward at organization and audit the talent that we do have and analyze staff skill sets to identify those transferable skills um, with that. So I think we've also really looked at collaborative uh, upskilling and reskilling as well to really get at communities of practice so that folks uh, across the organization can share their learnings together and come up with best practices so we're not having to reinvent uh, the wheel in all the different departments across the university. Um, and that's that's really helped. And I think, you know, by, by keeping that focus on the, the health and well-being as number one, but also this looking at collaborative learning and ways we can come together to share our learnings has really been, um, you know, an enabler, a strategic enabler for us at Queen's over the past few years. That's great. Thank you very much, all of you again. And so kind of some of the things I'm hearing here is you know, on the last point there, Dave, with the collaborative learning, it's almost the social learning that we were looking at in question one as well. It is, it's bringing people together. How do we learn from each other? Um, but really, yeah, the, this is a strategic decision. We're not just focusing on mandatory training. You know, we need to look at making sure that our as you said, like it's not it's not a sunk cost, it's an investment. And how do we do that? Well, if, if it, we're making an investment, we need to make sure that the training we're doing resonates with people, that it meets their needs, um, you know, like you all said, and uh, looking at how we can future proof. I mean, those statistics that you gave, Devin, were, were quite shocking. You know, 375 million jobs lost or amended due to AI. And some of those budgets, like you've said, Dave, we don't all have the budgets of, of Amazon. So, you know, with that in mind, let's think strategically and making sure that our training does meet the needs of people today, especially as we're looking at the whole employee coming to work. Um, we need to make sure we're focusing on, you know, mental health, physical health and well-being, and all of those pieces. So great. Some fantastic insights again. Thank you, everyone. Um, so then our third question is, what are some ways organizations can ensure their programs are aligned with their business strategy and goals in particular? So Dave, I'm going to come over to you first of all for this question. Great. Thanks, Allison. And yeah, this, this is such a, a great question. And I think it kind of builds off what we've already talked about. But it, it does start, I think, with the organization's strategic plan and business drivers and I think really, to me, also the values of the organization that you want, those values that you want everyone in the organization to be demonstrating on a daily basis. You know, you know, like if I could talk, you know, at Queens, we, we're a university with, I think, over 180 year uh, story of people with with really kind of bold dreams and ambitions committed to, to creating a better world. But we also know that 
things are, are changing rapidly and, and we need to um, embark on a new direction and, and channel our sense of social responsibility, as well as a need for greater equity, diversity, inclusion uh, going forward. So, um, you know, one of our, our strategic pillars or goals is organization culture, and it is supporting our people. And Queens has intentionally embedded that to ensure that we have training and development programs and resources uh, to not only celebrate our people, but also to help them to continually grow and develop to meet the, the needs and expectations of our community. Um, you know, we have an institution that values things like truth, responsibility, respect, freedom, and well-being. Um, and really to be successful and fulfill our vision for the future, all staff must feel respected, safe, valued, um, and empowered to, to thrive going forward. And that really means we need to have training and development uh, centered programs aligned to those values. So for example, if, if we value EDII um, as a principle, we need to ensure we, we recognize and provide programs and training on things like anti-racism and anti-oppression. If we value uh, well-being um, and mental health, we need to have programs and resources that champion these things to ensure uh, staff are, are healthy and thriving going forward. Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it really hits on, you need to continuously strive to um, really live the values of the organization and, and hopefully, um, the strategic plan and then the, the HR plan that, that follows that um, can really kind of show the importance, but also the investment uh, in training and development, ensure that you have metrics uh, to continue to measure how those things are doing and also course correct if things are not going quite, uh, you know, the way we hope as part of the, the, the strategic plan. Um, but yeah, with, with that, maybe I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Wiley to, to share her insights. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, so many great insights there. Uh, maybe I'll add to that. And uh, one of the things that I've found in my work is organizations often don't have a learning strategy, nor do they have a, you know, a chief learning officer. And so in the absence of you know, having some of those critical roles identified, having an articulated learning strategy and plan that is really designed to support your business priorities is absolutely critical. And when we're talking about future proofing your organizations uh, and, and learning being a key driver there, uh, if you don't have a learning strategy, you, you know, you're not really going to be able to tackle that. And so I think some of the key components there again are uh, the lack of understanding around the talent that exists in your organization. So really making sure that you're doing the work to understand your strategic goals and priorities going forward. But at the same time, you're, you're getting a really clear understanding of your workforce. Uh, and one of the things, again, that, I, you know, McLean's and company often says that um, workforce planning is one of the least effective uh, talent management practices. And so in terms of really, you know, strengthening your workforce planning efforts so that you do have that better understanding of the roles, your strategic roles, your core roles, the talent that maps to those roles um, and inside, uh, inside that planning and analysis, what are the actual skills that you're looking for that map to those more critical roles? Uh, and so I do think it is about drilling down into the details and building out skills taxonomies. I mean, we talk about competency models in organizations. Oftentimes they're so high level, they don't, they're not actually meaningful um, for employees. So we need to create the processes, the systems, the documentation um, that provides that level of detail, but also uh, it is something that is relatable to all of your employees. And again, when you're talking about EDI, um, important sort of concepts around uh, opening up that skills um, base to, to encapsulate all of the staff um, in your organization. Uh, so before I continue to ramble, let me pass it over to Devin. That was good rambling. Actually, you and you and Dave covered most of the headlines, so I don't have a whole lot uh, to add, uh, maybe just a couple of points. Um, first is it, it's, I think, one of the most salient parts of this is, is the organization has to understand its goals. Um, but also the employees have to understand 
the goals and they're clearly defined to them as well. And when it when you boil it down from a training perspective is that I find this is often missed where organizations don't explain why the training is needed to the employees. So, and I think that is a, that is a, a major miss. Some organizations get it right and, and do that, but some don't. So employees are, are kind of left out of the loop, so to speak, from a communication perspective, which but sometimes makes it challenging um, for them. And, and I'd say that in terms of creating training programs that, that have to be the right training programs, that they're actually addressing those skill gaps that exist instead of just having training for the sake of training. Um, and so with that, I'll move it back to Allison. Okay, great. Some fabulous insights again as well. And what I'm really taking away is, yes, we again, we're hearing the word strategic. We need to be strategic about this. And it really does come down to that high level strategy, but then really drilling down into, into the individuals and making sure that, yes, we're thinking strategically, but there is planning at, at every level here. And again, some of those terminologies that are coming up again, like future proofing and unleash the talent, things like this, you know, these are terms that we're hearing um, we're hearing a lot and, and out on program last week. So we were running talent management and, you know, Wiley asked the question, how many of you have um, a learning strategy? And one participant from one organization raised their hand in the entire room. So you're right, it's having that learning culture. It's having the chief learning officer and it's having that strategy in place and then making sure everyone is understanding that strategy and the role that they can take. So again, some fabulous insights there. And again, making sure that metrics, we are measuring success and, you know, course correcting, another great term there, we're course correcting if, if we're finding it's not working. Okay, wonderful. So we often hear, yeah, it's always the way. And, and, and right now in particular, I would say this question is important, you know, are we going into a recession? What, what is happening with the economy? So we often hear that training budgets are the first to be cut and the last to come back. And that has always felt like a mistake. So let's talk about the importance of continuous learning and the advantage that it can give organizations um, when it comes to things like productivity and retention in particular. So Devon, I'm going to come over to this question, uh, over to you first to walk up this question, please. Yes, thanks, Allison. And, yeah, and that's always, been the case is that T and D budgets usually get cut first, uh, whether it's a cost cutting uh, process or um, as we see recently in mass layoffs. And I always found it a bit interesting where organizations um, after going through a, a mass layoff period is they'll cut the training budget. Um, so it's not as if the employees who leave that were uh, laid off, they take the work with them, the work remains. And now the work is going to be done by fewer people, the employees that are still left in the organization. So cutting the training budget at that time would be counter, counterproductive, uh, to say the very least. But it does happen, um, which was always struggling to understand. Um, but I digress. I, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of continuous learning uh, and how organizations uh, organization should jump on that bandwagon. Uh, and I want to share a couple of interesting statistics. Um, studies have shown that 60%, 60% of millennials say that they join organizations based on the learning opportunities that that organization provides. So they make their decision in large part to join that organization because of the learning opportunities that are there. So 60%, that's quite significant when you're thinking about attracting uh, the, new, the new generation of, of workers, which is the millennial group. And what is it they're looking for? Well, it's learning opportunities. Um, which is a big piece of it. Another interesting statistic is that over 30% of millennials left their last employer because there was a lack of learning opportunities available to them within that organization. So you're looking at it from both ends, the recruitment and attraction and the exiting of the employee. So learning opportunities seem to be quite, quite uh, important for millennials. So, I mean, the calculus would seem to be pretty easy then. Uh, employers should look at providing continuous learning opportunities to their employees because one, it helps to attract the right employees. It also helps to retain them over time because these opportunities are available to them to increase their skills, to become more competent in different areas. And it also helps um, morale, obviously, of the employees if they're getting these opportunities. And we all know the cost of employee turnover. It's significant. I mean, it's, 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 it seems to be getting higher and higher, especially in today's labor market. So it just makes financial sense for organizations to invest time, invest money in having 
um, continuous learning opportunities for their employees. And for that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Devin. And, and yeah, I could really, you know, echo kind of what, what Devin is saying. We've, we've heard that loud and clear. We've, we've experienced that kind of uh, at Queens within the Faculty of Arts and Science. We've heard loud and clear from recruits that is usually the first question uh, most candidates are asking is what types of uh, learning and development opportunities currently exist, uh, as well as what types of career pathways uh, are provided. Um, within the faculty and at Queen's. And that's, we're also hearing that from our, our ongoing employees as well, just looking for career pathways, looking for stretch assignments, looking for a much uh, diverse uh, kind of work arrangements as well. So just really uh, hitting on the importance of investing in ongoing training. Um, and I think we've been quite fortunate and, and that's where I would really kind of hit on and really encourage other organizations and other kind of professionals and, and, and folks on our call today is to really try to embed um, supporting our your people and uh, providing training and development as you know a strategic pillar um, as part of your uh, plans going forward. Um, you know, we heard loud and clear as part of our strategic planning dialogues with all frontline staff of the need for ongoing training and development. Um, but we also heard that, unfortunately, because budgets were constrained, folks sometimes did not have the opportunities to take, you know, ongoing training and development. And we were losing staff because of that. Um, and, and luckily, we, we have a dean uh, that really champions ongoing professional development. Um, and and they committed, you know, funding, central funding that staff can uh, apply for annually so that they can receive funding for ongoing professional and development. Um, you know, and, and we've really found that attracting and retaining top talent is such an important aspect uh, to help employees build new skills, develop in the job, and also apply their learning in the workplace. So that's why I would really kind of encourage trying to, you know, look for ways to ensure that that training can can still happen, even when, you know, times are tough, when, when budgets can be, you know, cut back a little bit. Um, it's really uh, detrimental if you kind of forget about training and development, because, you know, as Devin hit on, and, and, and I can, can definitely uh, feel, feel the pain of that when you do lose staff and good staff, um, it's a lot more costlier uh, to onboard them and then train them up than it is to just continually provide ongoing training to existing uh, top staff. So if you can look for ways to get creative, uh, but also ensure that your current staff are feeling that you're investing in them, you see the, 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 the great things they're doing on a daily basis and you're providing back to them so that they can provide more, more to you and the organization is just so important. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Wiley to see if she has other thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. I'll, maybe I'll just add a few uh, a few thoughts here. Uh, one of the things um, that is really sort of again coming out in the research is is this notion of a pervasive learning model, and so learning at the need of speed, which is something I think that resonates for most organizations right now. Uh, again, one of the challenges, right, with learning uh, programs is is how quickly things are changing. So you implement one thing one day, and then the next day things pivot and change. So part of this whole idea around pervasive learning models is that it is really adaptable uh, and it's also meeting the, the needs of your employees. I think uh, Google, it, it really focuses the, the learning plans on their employees. So employees will actually uh, design their own learning plans, right? And so they're coming to their leaders with their own learning plan and it becomes sort of a conversation around what the individual's needs and interests are because I think it needs to be interest-based. I think Devin, you mentioned a lot of times learning is something, you know, that is designed in a corner office somewhere and people don't often understand how, you know, what is in it, what's in it for me. Uh, and so really you sort of taking that pervasive learning model 
um, that is about this dynamic way of learning, um, building in those social, you know, the, the social platforms that you can use to engage your employees, keeping in mind that most organizations have five generations in them right now. And so how are we thinking about learning in these more diverse ways, right? And that learning is, is, holds different meaning for different groups of people. And so we need to be really intentional about designing uh, learning that is going to meet the broad needs and the you know diverse needs of uh, our employees. Uh, and and with that, I'll I'll pass it back to Allison. Thank you. Oh, great! Some really great insights there as as well, and some I think really interesting statistics. You know, in terms of millennials, you know that so many care about the training and development opportunities, not just care but will actively leave organizations. And it would be interesting to see, you know, how the other generations fit into that as well. And, you know, absolutely, it is it is cheaper and more cost effective to retain employees than to gain new ones. I mean, we're hearing again a lot about the, the strategic pillar, you know, the importance of this strategy on this, but then involving people within the organization. You know, that's great at Google, where the employees are really designing their own training programs. Um, you know, and I would add to that that it's making the time as well you know I think by involving employees you're giving them the time you know we can have these plans and think yes this is the training I want to do but if then if employees don't have the time within their schedules if their work isn't adjusted so that they can take an hour or two hours whatever it may be to focus on this then that can be an issue as well so making sure that we have the time and involving people in these uh, decisions so Great, excellent insights there. So we'll come on to our next question now. Uh, very important, you know, especially over the past few years, this one uh, has changed a lot of conversations that we've had. So with remote work becoming more prevalent, how can organizations ensure training opportunities are available for all employees? So it's uh, accessible across the board for everyone, whether they're in the office, whether they're remote, whether they're in the field. So Wiley, I'm going to come over to you first to, to answer this one, please. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think for me, technology obviously is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, there are fantastic uh, platforms like LinkedIn Learning is a fantastic learning platform uh, that provides you know, tens of thousands of learning opportunities. And the, the nice thing about a tool like that is that you can actually, organizations can um, build their own sort of learning plans based on, you know, Dave talked about, you know, the values, how are we making sure that we're training employees that, you know, and, and the training and learning is aligned to our values. So you have this opportunity uh, to um, really maximize that tool to meet your own specific business needs. It has fantastic reporting capabilities as well. So when you're starting Starting to track, you know, who's taking what. Um, you have the ability to, to, I sound like I work at LinkedIn, I promise I, I'm not sponsored here, um, but you have the ability to pull reports from adjacent organizations to get an understanding of where um, their skills and, and learning and training programs uh, are focused. So I think having uh, having platforms that are accessible to employees and again, making sure that you're meeting the specific needs of employees. Some people are going to be more comfortable with technology. How do you create those learning environments? So again, we were talking about shifting meetings into these sort of more brainstorming sort of hackathon opportunities where you can just really get into a creative space that's around, you know, problem solving um, so there's different different ways that you can do it, um, but uh, being really clear, and I think that communication piece is so critical that we we make sure that we are modeling learning behaviors and a learning mindset on our teams uh, and using very consistent language around what that means for our organizations, what that means for our teams uh, will be really important to engage people regardless of you know where they may be sitting in the organization. Uh, so thank you, Allison, and I'll pass it on to you, Devin. Yeah, thanks, Wally. And I think, you know, obviously technology was was the biggest pickup here in, in, um, in terms of how people are learning now. Um, and you talk about LinkedIn learning. I agree with you, by the way. It's a great, a great platform. And, you know, I think organizations have really learned a lot about training here over the last three years in terms of how, how to um, engage their employees to continuously learn during the pandemic. And uh, that was a crucial, I think, stage uh, for, for learning and development. 
Um, and I think organizations had to become open-minded in terms of how training is now to be uh, conducted. It's not, it's not the regular classroom sessions anymore. It's not the, you know, the instructional format. It's, 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 you know, things like video, um, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of your uh, training through videos you know, going on YouTube or learning how to do things. So these micro learning sessions, if you like. Um, so I think em employers have to understand that there are different ways of, of, of doing this now. And, and I think a lot of organizations have understood that and are making obviously moves towards that. Um, and and I, I echo what, what Wiley said relative to communication as well. I think employees need to understand that these learning, avail uh, these learning opportunities are available to them. Uh, and some organizations are quite good with that. They send out email blasts or they have a center where um, or a website th that employees could log into to find what, um, what learning opportunities are available to them, whether it's internal or even external. Uh, so some organizations are quite good at doing that. Um, and I think that it's important for the organization to continuously, if, 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 in, if employees are working virtually still or, or during the pandemic, to maintain contact, because I think we all felt a bit disconnected during the pandemic. So I think, you know, organizations um, were proactive to continue to communicate with their employees um, in, in many different ways. But one was, hey, these are some things you could be doing um, to improve your skills. Um, just uh, just a couple of uh, additional notes. I know some organizations assign mentors to uh, to employees, new hires, um, and the men, what, part of the mentor's role is to assign them training that they feel is going to bring them up to the level that they need to be at. So that's the mentor's role. So kind of taking the employee on side and helping them get the skills that they need uh, through training. Really, really important to do that because, uh, and, and, and Wiley mentioned that as well, you're trying to model the right type of behaviors in the workplace. Um, so th those, those are the only things I wanted to add. I'll hand now over to Dave. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, I think, think Wiley and, and, and Devin kind of hit on most of the, the things I, I was thinking as well. Um, just one area that I would uh, emphasize is, um, it, it seems simple, but we've really found over the last couple of years, things like providing, the hardware, the internet, internet support and communication tools to enable both remote work and re remote learning um, is foundational. So um, including that hardware collaboration platforms like we're on today, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, high bandwidth, Wi-Fi or office furniture, um, just to ensure that folks are comfortable and can learn in a blended learning environment, be it synchronous or asynchronous. So um, I, I think Wiley hit on earlier too, just the need to engage with staff to learn about their learning style and what their learning objectives are. Um, some folks love love the videos and they are great. Uh, that's just part of life now. I know, you know if your dishwasher breaks at home, you usually go to Google and search kind of video how to how to fix the dishwasher and that just in time learning is so important. So that, that really works uh, as well uh, for us at work too, but then there's also people that learn better uh, in person or in class. So we, we need to provide that kind of hybrid uh, blended learning arrangement as well, just to make sure we're, we're meeting the needs of all staff and, and certain things may work better uh, in person. If you're talking about things like values or building trust, maybe that's a course that's that's in person, uh, but process improvements could be done, you know, online or through LinkedIn learning. So, so just really looking at what the subject is and, and what what works best, I think, is also important. Excellent. Yeah, some great tools there. Actually, I recently had an issue with my oven door and Googled it and fixed it, and then I like I had to cheat something. So yeah, the, I think the options we have these days are are you know unlimited. Um, but you're right; it is communication is critical. Making sure we have those tools, modeling behavior. Again, yes, it's so true. We have to model that behavior both in our language both in, you know, and being consistent with our language, all really key points there. Um, and the way that we, we've, we're learning as in working has changed. Not It's not a one size fits all these days. And we have to be really, really aware of that. So that's wonderful. So we have one of our kind of structured questions left before we get into the Q&A. So a big one, again, we've talked about budgets being cut. So, so getting back into really that investment piece, how can employers measure the effectiveness of their investment in training? How can we show that this is an investment 
what metrics can, should they track? So Dave, I'm going to come to you first for this question, please. Great, thanks, Allison. Yeah, yeah, such an important question, especially when times, you know, budgets are uh, being constrained or whatnot. Uh, I think usually when we plan training and development, we do kind of expect uh, from, from the uh, senior leadership, at least expects to see uh, improved skills and competencies and improved productivity, uh, greater retention rates uh, and improved uh, employee engagement scores after we deliver, you know, training training programs uh you know i think sometimes it can be you know as simple as asking questions like how effective was the training and helping learners gain knowledge and skills uh were the learners able to apply what they learned to improve their performance at work and uh, what other benefits did the the training or the training program achieve so i think just looking at at, at things like that um you can get it you can dive into it a bit more and look at things like, uh, you know, what I've used in the past, like the Kirkpatrick evaluation model for evaluating training, which is kind of a four level approach that looks at things like uh, one reaction was the course content relevant or easy to follow. Uh, level two could be learning. What was the course completion rate? Um, you know, do you have any supervisor feedback from the learning? Uh, the third area could be behavior um, are receiving through on the job observation or informal feedback from peers and managers of improved uh, behavior on the job or on the job performance. Um, and fourth could be results, you know, improved organization or business results, increased productivity, quality of work, uh, employee retention that we've hit on, uh, higher morale or engagement scores. So, um, you know, I, I think it's really what, what works best for your organization or, or for your team, but there's lots to do. But I think it's just important to say what, what does get, get measured does uh, get completed. So it is important to try to, to measure it. Uh, however you do that, just trying to get senior leadership and staff involved in, in the ROI on the training. Um, but uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Wiley for her insights. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, so a couple of reflections here for me. Uh, I think when I think about you know a continuous learning culture, one of the things that we're really trying to do there is improve internal mobility. And so there are great tools, you know, ta the talent marketplace, for example, which you know I would think of as almost like an internal. Uh, LinkedIn uh, that you could have in your organizations and, and a tool like SharePoint uh, could be leveraged to do something like that. And really what your talent marketplace is doing is uh, it's providing a space and a place for employees to post, you know, uh, updates on skills that they're building and learning in various learning programs. It provides leaders with an opportunity to post, you know, opportunities for projects. So when we're talking about secondments and mentorships, like this is really sort of the tool that you can use to, uh, you know, again, we're talking about unleashing the talent in your organization. And so, uh, you know, and I think the, the way that we define learning in our organizations really needs to expand, right? Uh, and, and one of the things that, you know, we need to do is help managers and leaders understand how to unleash that talent. So you want to look at your mobility rates. So when we're talking about the effectiveness of learning, how do we look at, you know, talent hoarding is one word, right? Managers who love their talent and they want to hold them tight. So what are your mobility rates as an organization? What are, you know, individual managers, you know, mobility rates? Uh, and how are we training managers to have those kinds of conversations with their staff and encourage them to use a talent marketplace as an opportunity to learn as well. Uh, so I think, again, it, it is thinking dynamically around how learning happens in organizations. And it's not always those sort of fully structured learning programs that we're so often uh, accustomed to. Uh, it's about creating some of the tools and the spaces that will really engage um, that sort of continuous learning. And as you build them, you build in your measurements. And one more quick thing I'll say is oftentimes we do not clearly define what the outcomes are that we're driving. So we, we brush past that. So we don't even know what it is that we're gonna measure at the end of it. 
And so I think organizations spending way more time defining the problem that they're trying to solve and how learning is going to solve that problem. Because one of the things that I've experienced in my career in learning, oftentimes we use learning as a solution to a problem when in fact learning isn't always that solution. So doing that deeper dive in terms of understanding what it is that we're trying to solve, what does that outcome look like? Um, and so Devin, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to, to share any reflections you might have. Thanks, Wiley. And, and, and I think that um, Wiley and Dave hit on most of the topics. Um, I do agree, though, knowing what you're looking for, um, what are you looking um, to, to see change, I guess, is very important. And, and I agree with Wiley there. Sometimes that isn't known uh, or, or it's not thought of uh, as much as it should be. Um, I come from a psychology background, so uh, I like the, the idea of observing behavior. Um, and of course, Training is linked to trying to have a behavioral modification um, to you know, some, some effect of change that you see happening on the work floor. Um, so observing the behavior, what you're looking for, if you know what you're looking for, and actually seeing it is, is I think, a good reflection of how effective that training has been and seeing it over a consistent period of time. Obviously, it's not the two days after the training you see it and then you don't see it again, and how you're able to, to in effect, keep that transfer of knowledge within the employee base is, is uh, very important. And, and as both Dave and Wiley said, I think getting feedback from the employees is, is, is very important and oftentimes missed by organizations. You know, how was the training? You know, did it make sense to you? Are you able to utilize those skills in, 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 a, in a, um, an effective way in your role? Uh, sometimes that's missed. Uh, employees don't have their input put into the programs they've just taken. And I think that is a huge miss. Uh, for organizations who don't do it. Um, and um, so those are the two points I wanted to add. Uh, Allison, back to you. That's great. Really, really great points there. So yeah, I think it is clearly defining an outcome. You're absolutely right. That we, we have to know what it is the outcome is supposed to be and what we're supposed to, to measure. And, and looking at that long-term consistency change in behavior, getting the feedback from employees, you know, and looking at, like you said, productivity, employee engagement, we are looking at changing and modifying some kind of behavior or building skills um, you know, and I love that improve internal mobility. It reminds me of an Adam Grant quote that I saw recently where he says, if you don't have any internal candidates, you failed as a manager or a leader, or you failed as an organization. And it's so true. We are looking to continue the upward mobility um, of our employees so that we're not hoarding that talent or, you know, ignoring that talent altogether. So some really, really great comments there. Um, we do have um, some questions that have been coming in, so I am going to go over to those questions now. Um, so we'll come a bit more of a hot seat here. I'll read out a question, and if you'd like to take it on first, please do. Um, so the first one that we have, um, again, potentially very timely with what today, you know, we've got I think 155,000 uh, government employees that are off the job today, uh, unionized environment. So this question is to do with the unionized environment. Is it more complex? to implement a training and development strategy in a unionized environment. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so Allison, I could take that, take that one on. I'll be first to jump into that pot, boiling pot of water. Um, and and the, the answer is the prototypical HR answer, and it depends. Um, and, and I think that's right. It, it depends. It depends on the relationship between the parties, right? So the bargaining unit and the employer. Um, and a lot of that depends on bargaining histories and so on and, 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 and the like. Uh, it's certainly not impossible to do it. You certainly can do it. It's, it but it, I think it in large part has to do about the relationship between the union and uh, the employer. And specifically, are you able to create a strategy around the provisions of the collective agreement or the conditions of the collective agreement? And sometimes that's a bit of a trick shot, um, but it's not uh, impossible, certainly. Uh, especially of two willing dance partners that want to do it, uh, which is uh, very important. But the collective agreements across Canada are scattered with pr provisions that are, um, I would say, very proactive in this sense. So I'll give you an example. I see a lot of, in the work that I do, a lot of collective agreements that have joint training. Um, and for example, workplace investigation training within an organization is, is I've seen in, in a couple of cases where uh, shop stewards and supervisors are learning this together. In fact, uh, some of the facilitators are unionized employees. Some are supervisors and they swap the training. 
and and so they go together they go at it together which i think is very proactive maybe not the norm uh, but it does happen those provisions do exist in collective agreements and even for collective bargaining training, uh, we know that the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service provides that training to parties that are entering bargaining. And a lot of them do that, right, with, with, you know, with good faith intentions to, to get to a collective agreement. So it, it is possible, um, and it, I would say it's also more complex, um, but, it, but again, I think it's possible, yeah. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Devin. In the interest of trying to get through a number of different questions, maybe we'll just have one response on each of these. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Dave, next question has come in specifically for you. Um, so <laughs> maybe a loaded question. Uh, can you teach empathy to a leader or is that an either they are or they aren't situation? Well, that's a yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, Wiley or Devin may be able to, to better answer it than myself, but I'll I'll take a stab. Um, I would uh, boldly say say yes. Um, it is. I mean, it is definitely harder than maybe you know teaching what we would call uh, a harder skill than I know empathy can be seen as as termed as like a soft skill. But I th think it's so important. Things like empathy or integrity. Um, this is a, a question that's come up up a lot uh, to me over the years. Like, can can you teach empathy? Can you teach integrity? Or are you kind of born with it? Um, I come from a background where I think we we can build on this. Um, definitely, you know, there there are things through our upbringing uh, that may be harder to overcome. I I would say it, it is a harder skill to build, um, but it can, uh, you know, we can have programs on it to, to teach uh, the importance of, of empathy and, and understanding and esteem. Um, and I, I see learning as a journey as well. It's not an event where you go to an empathy course and, you know, a half day course, and then everything is, is going to be cured or not. You know, I think uh, Wiley and, and, and Devin hit on this as well. Lear learning is a journey. There needs to be a before, during, and after uh, of any learning. And I think if you underline the importance of empathy and continue to have dialogue and discussions on the importance and why that may be a value for your team, a value for your organization. Um, I think, you know, it, it can be, it can be taught, it can be honed, it can be built off. Um, but again, I think it goes back to the importance of strategic hiring as well. So if, if empathy and some of those uh, competencies are very important to you. I think you should be looking at that and asking some of those questions to help see if, if folks can demonstrate that uh, through the, the recruitment and onboarding process also. Great, yeah, it's so true. It's not, you know, we're not going to go to a half day session or an hour session. And yet I'm now empathetic. That's a uh, checkbox check is done. That's a very, very good point. Excellent. Um, so I think we have time for one final question, and I know that others have come in. So what we can do is take those away after the session and make sure that those are answered. Um, but Wiley, I'm going to come to you on this one. Are there any thoughts on how to train managers on diversity and inclusion issues? Uh, we're having some troubles getting some supervisors on our floor to take it seriously. We want to use the carrot rather than the stick approach because they've been very defensive about past training initiatives on diversity. Great. I mean, that is a, a great question, a complex question, not an yeah. easy one to answer necessarily. I, you know, my instinct there is the first thing you want to do is understand uh, where that defensiveness is coming from. Uh, you know, is it that they've been on training that for whatever reason wasn't meeting their needs? It's also a, a topic that can can make people uncomfortable, right? There's a real learning edge for individuals here. Uh, and so we we touched on, I think, the concept of psychological psychologically safe learning environments. And this is something that's a really, you know, it's a tough one for organizations to, to nail. But if you don't have a psychologically safe environment, it is really hard to run training like this because it does require a, a, a real degree of vulnerability. And in some cases, you may need to work individually with supervisors before you ask people to engage in group training, because this really is a journey that is individual uh, to a large extent. 
and then of course we're aligning we're aligning that learning to our you know EDI sort of framework so I think there's there's different ways that you can do this I think getting to the root cause of why people are feeling defensive and uncomfortable about the training figuring out what is it that you can be providing to them that will help to support their learning needs understanding the different levels of maturity around the learning that is required. And again, that would be at an individual level. Uh, and then thinking about doing, yeah, that one-on-one -on -one before you move into that group training. So a bit more assessment, I would say, but also creating that space where people can talk about what their fears and anxieties are around the training, because it is, um, it can be really uncomfortable for people. I hope that, I hope that helps a little bit. That's great, really helpful. Thank you so much. So thank you, Devin, Dave, and uh, Wiley for your insights today. It has been invaluable learning, certainly for me, uh, and I'm sure for everybody on the call as well. Um, so very quickly, I am just going to, we will be sending out a slide deck afterwards with this information, just to kind of show some of the upcoming programs that we have for the rest of 2023 across the country. So if you would like to engage with the IRC further, we would love to see you in some of our programs, be it in our virtual classroom or in person. Uh, like I've said, you will be getting a copy of these slides. Um, and there's also a little bit of information here about each of those certificates that I touched on before, as well as the ways that you can stay connected with us. So if you have any questions, you know, post webinar, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that uh, your learning and development strategies um, are successful going forward and yeah, wishing you all the best. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Take care.